If you ever imagined traveling from coast to coast, but with the simplicity of a subway ride, you won't have to imagine much longer. I traveled to SoCal to visit Hyperloop Transportation Technologies with Bebop Gresta, who explained the technology behind this new high-speed platform rooted in the minds of many renowned visionaries. The story of Hyperloop started in the 18th century. When you look at the evolution of rail, not a lot of people knows that there was another bunch of scientists that they were working on a parallel transportation system. There was a tube with inside these weird capsules that they were dreaming to launch at the speed of 300 kilometers per hour. And they were even a builder, uh, Eli Beach, that in 1890 built one kilometer in it, what it will be called the New York subway. So between wow. Warren and Broadway, they built one kilometer of an evacuated tube <laughs> there was a pneumatic rail, let's say, with a reduced pressure environment. This poor guy went bankrupt <laughs> very quickly because, you know, the rail industry were fierce in this yeah. period. It was basically taking over everything. Sure. Even Disney were developing a vision of the world that there was Epcot. And inside Epcot, there was an hyperloop system. So, over and over during the last century, you've seen humanity dreaming about tra traveling in tubes. And that's uh, with air you were talking about? the new the They were trying to use different systems. Yeah. Uh, the initial designs were more like a pneumatic mail system. So there was air pushed in and in the other side there was something sucking out. But in reality, in the beginning of the century, Robert Goddard, the father of the rocket science, patented a technology that was very similar to the Hyperloop, to the modern concept of the Hyperloop. Then the entire scientific community went against him, saying that humans cannot travel above 100 miles per hour. <laughs> and the entire community was agreeing, and right. he became the father of the rocket science, but we didn't add an Hyperloop. I guess we've, we've proven some of that to be erroneous. Wrong. Yeah. It was wrong. So now you can tell me how all this works. Yeah, well, you're talking about tubes. You usually look at these kind of things, you know, carbon steel, very <laughs> heavy. Yeah. It arrives in big plaques, it gets melted, and it got spiral welded in giant tubes of 30 meters long. They're very heavy, yeah, very yeah. complicated to manage because they get created in the factory and then shipped with giant yeah. trucks yeah. that goes at 20 miles per hour. Very complicated. Right. So our crowd model allowed us to work in uh, contemporary in different other solutions. This is, for example, a fiberglass solution that oh, can yeah. allow these tubes to be extruded, extruded in place, or we are also other material like ultra high performance concrete that can allow us to 3D print the structure and have a very quick and very efficient system in place. This is the famous Vibremium that we trademark, by the way. Vibremium? Yeah, Vibremium. Yeah. How do you spell that, Vibremium? Vibremium. Yeah. No, it was, uh, at the beginning, it was a joke because my co founder said, uh, after hearing our scientists talking about a material that is seven times more flexible than yeah. aluminum and two times more strong than steel, he said, oh, that's Vibremium. And then we said, well, I wonder who owns Vibremium. <laughs> and then we discovered that nobody filed any patent, oh, awesome. so we, we trademarked it. That's very cool. And it's uh, a material that we developed with our partner Carbures that has 70 touch points. It means that there are sensors that are thin like air that can be meshed into the material and can tell you 70 different kind of data. And with big data analysis, the opportunities are endless because sure. now we have materials that are smart and can tell us if they break, when, and how to fix it. So for those of us who have no idea really much, you know, anything about Hyperloop, from a first glance, are we, where they're looking at it saying, oh, well, it's a, it's a train inside of a tube, or it's, you know, a version of the subway above ground, and, you know, but what are the differences? What, what are the misconceptions? Imagine to take a capsule like this, yeah. full of people. You put this capsule inside the tube, 
you take out the air from the tube so there's no resistance. Now you can move the capsule from point A to point B at almost the speed of sound using a tiny fraction of the energy. Wow. The key is the efficiency. Yeah. Everybody's talking about speed. In reality, the coolest factor about the Hyperloop, yeah. it's the efficiency. We can, using a combination of renewable energy, produce up to 30% more energy than we consume. Wow. And this is a revolution because it's cheaper yeah. and more efficient than anything else. So one of the biggest problems in transportation yeah. is the friction. A lot right, of energy right, is right. used to actually fight the resistance of the air. In the Hyperloop, we have created a low pressure environment from one to 10 Pascal. So it's not a vacuum, but we are very near. And when you are in a vacuum, the only friction that you have is the one that you are basically uh, pushing on the bottom. That's why we searched for a technology to actually levitate the Hyperloop. And we found it in an amazing place, in the Lawrence Livermore Lab, the national lab where the Manhattan Project and the uh, atomic bomb was right. created by Einstein. They have a big knowledge about uh, electromagnetism. And Professor Richard Post uh, in the 90s discovered a very interesting principle. Hmm. Let me show you. So, when you have a magnet, this is a neodymium magnet, and you have it pushing on a magnetic material, in a conductive material. This is aluminium, it's not particularly conductive. If you steady, it doesn't exert a lot of magnetism. But as soon as you move it, there's the drag force creates ah. a current that reacts and generates a drag. So the faster this goes, the more electric impulse you get. Now imagine that the capsule is on wheels and accelerate. At a certain speed, this configured in a special configuration allow you to generate a very powerful magnetic field on the bottom that allow you to levitate the capsule without using electricity. This is called passive levitation. That means that you only need some energy to push it at the beginning, and then it flies like in space. So how are people gonna breathe inside this tube if you're removing all the air from the tube? The problem of breathing inside an hyperbaric chamber was solved some years ago, it's called airplane. <laughs> we are replicating yeah. the same environment. Of course, in our environment, we recreated the same concept by using new technologies, so it's safer, we don't need windows, for example, right. because we have high-definition screen that can actually replicate reality. So what, can I experience any of it now? So I can show you a little uh, sneak preview okay. of what it looks like to be in an hyperloop. Wow. So this is a one-third of one third long of a real capsule. We are conceiving spaces. They are tailor-made for your needs. When we travel right now, we are not conceiving what we need as humans. First class, second class, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. Right. When you're going to work, you need something different than when you're coming back to work. When you're with your wife, you need something different than when you're with your children or when you're a tourist. Same person, different needs. In the Hyperloop, you have spaces that can adapt on the function and the need of that particular journey. So you have these spaces and screens that can adapt. If you wanna do business, we allow you to do business. You wanna sleep, we give you the best sleep of your life. If you wanna have health or learn something, yeah. we are designing spaces and content that can actually provide you the best service. And so I'm inside a tube, I look out the windows, I would just see two, but obviously we're seeing a lot more than that right now. So tell me about this. These are screens that, uh, this is the first generation, we have a second generation coming. These screens allow you not only to look outside or a slower version of outside, but we can also simulate other ambient. 
the future, the past? Um, do you want to see California when there was the gold rush? I can bring you there. It's not only a very cool way to travel yeah. in the future, it's a monetization system. Yeah, I can pick the outside that I want yes. to enjoy. Exactly. Wow, interesting. This is really Tailor made and focus on the human experience because passenger experience right now sucks in the rest of the transportation industry. We want to bring back the joy of travel. You can actually, with a very sophisticated artificial intelligence, take the capsule that brings you closest to the final destination. So it's like a giant elevator. When you go to the modern elevator right now, you put a number. Not, you don't push the button anymore. The reason is simple. There's an artificial intelligence that sends you not the closest elevator, but the most efficient. The one that will serve more people in the shortest amount of time. We imagine an hyperloop with the horizontal elevator that will send you the right capsule at the right moment that will feed your need. So I'd go to a, a center somewhere. What would you call that where all of the Hyperloops are gathering and I choose the right one. A portal? It's a station. A station? <laughs> oh, that makes sense. The Hyperloop station. And I say I'm ready to go to Chicago now. I'm in Cleveland. And it'll send me the one that I need and to and be the then most you efficient. And will be able to arrive there. I can't wait to ride on one. This video is inspired by our PBS series, Reconnecting Roots. Visit ReconnectingRoots.com to watch the full episodes or to check out our music and podcast. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe so we can keep making more. Thanks for watching.